Hello, friends, and welcome to To The Point, the home services podcast that focuses on marketing and operational solutions to help you get better. Because if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Now, let's cut through the bullshit and get to the point. Everybody, do we have a show for you today? I hope you are sitting down. Most likely you are because you're probably driving somewhere in your office or on an airplane. But it's going to be a good one. I'm your host, Cristiano. I've got my co-host on here, actually not in studio this time, in our Charlotte location, Mr. Tall Paul Redman. Hey, everybody. I am ear-to-ear smiles about today, so just (laughs) pumped for our guest. Let's go. So we got to wrap a little bit with uh, with our guest ahead of time, and and we met him earlier at an at a, uh, an event in North Georgia of all places. Um, and we'll talk about that later. But I want to get this introduction out there because when you think about like I was showing my son Rambo, right? Like I'm 40, my son never heard about Rambo, but. John Rambo was a badass in our day, right? Like, I loved Rambo because he was, like, hardcore guy, right? And then I show my son Rocky Balboa, and he's like, wait, Rambo is Rocky? And I, so I'm having to explain to him, yeah, man, Sylvester Stallone is his name. He's an actor, but he's a real badass, right? A lot of people, I think it's fair to say, would look at our guests like, this dude is one of those type dudes. He's slightly crazy but brilliant all mixed up into one is that a pretty solid explanation of this guy paul absolutely let's let's get him so without further ado i want to introduce our guest he is the first lightweight ufc champion of the world mr jens pulver what's up my man how you doing man what's going on everybody you know it's like I'm running in here. It's like you're getting ready to go to the go to your meeting, and you're like, "Holy crap! I forgot my pants." And I'm like, "That's why I got the green screen because everything was working. I had all of this green screen. I was gonna have fires back there, and throwing things up, and, and just let everybody see this color." And it's like I had this beautiful suit picked out, and I'm like, "Man, I had stains on my pants, and I had to throw it." Now I'm just running in my underwear, whatever. We're just gonna let it happen. So I feel a little naked with the green screen, but. I'm here. I you thought I here. thought you went with the green screen because it made you look less pale. <laughs> no, that's why I've got the I've got the I've got red curtains that I put over these lights to start taking away that a little bit because yeah, me and Sunshine we don't meet we don't meet up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I live in I, I'm in Phoenix. So I'm it's a little different. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, see, lucky for you, this is I live in Iowa. We don't we don't get such things for. It's maybe a couple of months, like I said. I don't think, if I'm correct, the uh, groundhog seen his shadow. He so did. it's gonna be an early. It's gonna be an early spring, so the snow is starting to melt, and then you know, then it's time to get outside and get off that winter belly and get ready for like a <laughs> hell on the hill. I mean, it's time to get out there and, and, and peel off that that the winter, and then that's where yeah, pasty white. I got looking at myself going, oh, this is terrible. I was like, I need to get like some kind of hand screens on these lights so they can give me some kind. of I need a tan. This dude, is terrible. I, no, all you got to do is go get a spray tan. I promise. Ain't nobody going to make fun yeah, of you. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, right? we have we have Photoshop yeah. artists on our team like no other. Yeah. So, so listen, <laughs> I want to tee this thing up real quick. I want to tee this thing up because we're going to go off on other tangents. I know it. So I want to at least int- uh, introduce or go, go into how we met Jens. And what it is is that uh, also being the CEO of, of Rhino, um, we go on an executive retreat every year where we start teeing up our next year or talking about what we've accomplished in the beginning of a year. And so we did things a little differently this year. We actually made it a two part deal. And the first part was we wanted to go and do something totally crazy together that bonded us outside of work shit. Okay. We wanted it to be something real raw that we would never forget. So, um, being a consumer of Jesse Itzler's content, which if you've never heard of Jesse Itzler, he's wrote a couple books. He's an amazing business guy. Um, great speaker. Um, you'll have to check him out. Just Google it. You'll see a bunch of stuff. Um, but I connected with Jesse and started to, to develop a relationship with him. And he told us about this camp he was having called BYLR, which you can see Jens is representing by chance on his sweatshirt. BYLR means build your life resume. So we went to sleepaway camp in North Georgia, myself and my executive team, including Paul, um, our VP of sales at Rhino. And so we go there 
And I'm like, okay, cool. It's sleepaway camp. They've got some really good speakers coming to talk to us. I saw Jen's on the list, which I was stoked about. I saw some other guys, a memory coach that we were on there. I was stoked about. I knew Jesse was going to speak. So a lot of good shit that was going on there. And then I knew there was a physical piece of this. And I didn't really train for the physical piece of this. Like when I say I didn't really train, like I did zero training for this. I just, I just see that there's like a four hour like deal, like an endurance race. And I've done Spartan races and tough mutters and things like that. And I hate running, but I did it just for them to, to mentally overcome something. And so I get to this camp and Jesse says, this is going to be a four hour deal. Like, it's not, can you get it done within four hours? It's fucking four hours. Like, you run for four hours in the North Georgia Hills going through all these obstacles, all this stuff. And I'm like, I didn't even run a tenth of a mile to practice for this thing. So talk about having to overcome a little mental adversity. I was in it. But what it did do was it bonded not only us, but everybody there in a unique way because everybody's hurting. Even if you train for it, four hours of straight running is a long-ass time to run. So you have a lot of mental things that, you have, that you're trying to break through in a four-hour run. And so what that did was it made me start to think like, man, if I can do this with zero training, imagine what I could have done with a little bit of training. And then to me, the bond that comes from that and the, and the takeaway from that is, not only do we become closer because we accomplished this together as a team, but it also made me understand, like, I can get through so much. Even when my brain says I can't, I know I still got another 30 40% left in the tank. It's just my mind is telling me to stop, and I got to be able to work through that. And that's completely applicable to anything in life that you're trying to accomplish your goals, whether you're starting a business. Like a lot of our customers, some of them are new, some of them are old, but every single one has barriers to get through. So we met Jens there. I'm talking to Jens before he goes on. And if you remember this, Jens, we're talking and he's like, and he's being Jens. He's kind of like get starting to go all over the place. Slight, maybe a little bit, <laughs> a little bit nervous about going up and speaking. This dude yeah. goes up there and drops bomb after bomb after bomb. And this place gives you a, Unbelievable. Sta- a standing O when you're done, man. Like a standing O because it was a raw, real emotional story that came from real experiences and it was just beautiful, dude. And I had at the I gained more respect for you in that whole conversation. I'm like, this dude's got it figured out, man. He's legit. All right. So um, I cannot thank yeah, you enough, right. dude, for being on this show because I know we're going to get into some uh, good stuff. But let me tell you the biggest takeaway. I got goosebumps right, and I even and I even got to the question <laughs> yet. So so this is where you and I will be. You, you're going to notice some similarities. Is the purpose of this podcast is again is to try and get our listeners to find ways to overcome the obstacles that they're inevitably going to hit on their business. If they're a technician listening who's trying to start his own company, there's lots of things they've got to figure out. Financial, um, marketing, operational, all these things are going to have to figure out. If they're already in it and trying to, you know, grow the business, there's more obstacles. How do I get employees? I'm running into this roadblock. And a lot of times it's easy to, to stop because it's hard. And that's where a lot of businesses quit and fail. And it comes down to a mentality. You know, and just doing it. Like if you look in some of the, uh, one of the walls in our offices, don't talk about it, be about it. It's like, do something. And, and on the back of that, one of Jesse's shirts he gave out said, no, zero days. So you might only accomplish a little bit, but you got to keep chipping away at it every day. You cannot have any zero days. You got to keep moving forward. And sometimes that's not the easiest thing to do. So what will happen and what Jens will be able to share on the show is this dude's overcome a ton of shit in his time and accomplished a lot of amazing things but it certainly wasn't without massive hurdles, right, Jens? Yeah, I mean, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So the most yeah. the most appealing story for me, dude, to, to bring that back around, was when you talked about, um, and I want you to go through a little bit of your of your history, and I'll, and I'll bring you back into it. But when you talked about the Uno fight at UFC 30, is when I was like, that was the most amazing story I've ever heard. Whenever you whenever you got the nickname. Your nickname changed after that fight. That was the right fight, right? No, there was the fight with John Lewis. That's that, and, okay. And, yeah, the John Lewis fight. So what happened? Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Me. So, so that's right. The Uno fight was when that was the UFC 30 when you won the. That was uh, winning right, the world right. title. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. But I got the nickname beforehand, and it was just I was just in so much pain, and that was the biggest thing. Is I had I was so tired. Of everybody called me, you know, pulverized. I'm like, pulver, pulverized. <laughs> I'm like, I don't like that, you know, and so. 
just in training camp, probably like in every day, everything that anybody does, just the mundane every day of coming in and going through the, the workouts. I don't re- I only know what day it is based on are we striking today, are we running today, we lifting, depending on the workouts. But you don't really pay attention to what day it is, but except for what's happening on the workout. And I just kind of, again, I just go through the motions. I have my coffee, and I'm just, ah, 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 and I'm just seeing this. And Pat Miltz goes, oh, we ain't you just a little evil bastard this morning? I go, oh, my God. I go, little evil bastard. I'm like, yes. I go, I got to have that name. I go, I want that name. And he's like, I'll tell you what. You win your next fight by knockout, and we'll call you, we'll change, it'll be your name. I'm like, awesome. So the long story is, like, I was really injured. I was hurt really bad leading up to this fight, and I'll go into that tangent. But I didn't get the credit for the fastest knockout, which was 12 seconds for a long time because the time was messed up. But literally 11.5 seconds later, bam, I became Little Evil. Yes. And uh, so <laughs> that's amazing. And that was never running up. And they, that's where he said Little Evil was backstage soaring high with, with, our, with our own James Rummy. So first they were calling me Little Eagle. Then it was Little <laughs> Evil. You know, so it, and I'm like, yes, it's Little Evil. Then we changed it to Little Evil. And it's crazy because nobody ever heard the name. So everybody's always asked, like, well, what's it? So what is it? Sure, it's, so it's actually Little Evil was short for Ooey, ain't you a Little Evil bastard this morning? <laughs> and I went out to, I won, I won my knockout. I ran up to McCarthy and go, that's my shirt. You promised me. So he had to give me his, his ref shirt. And I looked at Pat and go, I'm Little Evil. And <laughs> That's how it started. Yeah, yeah. 11. I love, love it. 11.5 seconds. Good night. Yeah. And that it. was the thing. I didn't get credit for that until later, but now it's been a fit. It's changed up. So officially, somehow when they started the time, the clock was already running. You know what I mean? They hit the horn, but the referee hadn't walked out there yet and did the, are you ready? Are you ready? And then boom. So there was a 30 seconds. To, so I never got credit for when while it was 12 seconds. I think it was a fast knockout. I never got credit for it until later they acknowledged it was 11.5 seconds Huge. was the, uh, the, the the official time now. Oh, I'm listening. Okay, Paul, go ahead. No, no, I got a question. So if yeah. you just – so that's against another professional fighter. Put someone like me in the ring or Chris, no offense, like straight civilian. How long can someone like us last in the ring with you before we're knocked out? How long can we run? Well, you know – well, that's the thing. You know, it, it's not even. It's really what it's about. It's, it's anybody can throw. A, I mean, there can be that one blind punch and boom, and it hits you, and down you go. I mean, it, it just depends. But when the one thing that I do tell people is, there's a mad difference, and it's in anything that you do in life. Some people are just like more comfortable. Again, I always use my wife as a perfect example. Cause she's an ICU nurse, and her knowledge. And it's like I married a world champion because the way she just she built up her. her concrete foundation and just the knowledge that she has i'm like dang i used to tell myself oh i was just a big dumb fighter i'm just a dumb fighter i don't i can't talk to people when it comes to business i can't talk to people when it comes to, and that's where when i met itzler i was like i can't relate to these you know these these people that have created all these companies but then the more i started thinking about it there's just a mentality there's a mentality that goes with it that everybody has it's just that world champion status and what it boils down to is are you willing to do all the mundane little things and fill your autopilot? Fill that thing. So I tell everybody this, and I'll get back. I know I'm going on the tangent. Oh, go, go. I tell go. everybody. So good. I tell everybody the three little pigs, and what it is is the first one made his house out of straw. Basically, he just watched YouTube and learned how to do finishes, and he learned the exciting things: the the arm bar, the choke, the knockout punch. You know what I mean? And then you've got the the next pig. I mean, he made his house out of sticks. So he probably did a little conditioning, a little running, but he still basically was looking at the finish. Then you've got the third pig who made this concrete foundation and did that boring shit, the mundane, the running every day, the drills, the repetition, 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 repetition. Fill your autopilot. So there's things that you'll do out there that you don't even have to think. So now you can make, so he built his house out of, con- he had a concrete foundation, built his house out of bricks. So now basically one day that could be a living room. The next day you could change it and become a movie theater. It can become something else. This day, this is a bedroom. So inside of that foundation, inside the strength of that structure, you can make small adjustments. So in the fighting world, depending on who I'm fighting, I can make small adjustments on their ground game, on their stand-up game, or how we want to fight. And that's what I tell people. So And everybody, the other two pigs wanted to finish fast, and so they're out there chilling. So when the wolf came in, they're over there. Now guess what? They're all knocking on this other – they're all knocking on the third pig's door board because he took the time and everybody laughed at him and said yo 
you're taking way too much time. There's too many other things that we can do. And if you think about it in everybody's business, nobody really takes the time to really, that's what separates. And I'm like, oh my God, it's, I'm like, I married a world champion because of the knowledge. And then the more I talk to people that have created businesses and the more that we started relating and like you talk to people that just, they have such a base of a, a ground the knowledge of their game. It's awesome to talk to them. I mean, again, technical individuals that know about the computer world and stuff like that. I'm such a fan, but I got no idea what I'm talking about. But the more I started relating to them, like, well, I do get uh, repetition every day, doing the mundane, the boring things that nobody wants to do. You know what I mean? And then, you know, they, they see the lights and the celebration at the end, but they don't realize how much you get. It makes me think of the iceberg, how you just see the tip of that thing hanging out the water and there's just this massive right. body of things <laughs> underneath it. That's, so that was always, you know, the three little pigs. That's been one of the things that I've always carried with me. Dude, that analogy is, I've never heard, I've heard, obviously heard that story so many times, but never have I ever pictured it quite like that. The, uh, yeah, I mean, just that mundane and to make that concrete foundation. So again, you can make small adjustments, build a house out of bricks and every room you can change up inside of this. So for me, it's based on my opponent. The house is there, the foundation is still there, everything I've trained, the mundane, the boring, the repetition, repetition, yep. repetition, working on your footwork, working on all the things. Like, it's great. Hey, I understand you want to learn this submission, but one, how are you going to get in shape? How are you going to get across the cage? You're going to set your opponent. How are you going to get there, get through their arsenal, get them to the ground successfully, control the position to get to that arm bar? You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, it all sounds well, it's good. It's like, I want to be a millionaire. Okay, well, how do you want to get there? Hopefully it just lands and bam, hits the floor. <laughs> or, you know, do you have a game plan? Is there something every day that you want to work on? Whatever your goal is, whatever your passion is. And that's what I started realizing is we all have passion. We all have goals. So it doesn't matter. I'm no longer, I'm not just a dumb fighter. I'm like, I get it. I'm a world champion like the rest of these people. And some just put in the work. Some put in half the work. And some don't put in any, but they talk about it all the time, how they're going to do this and they're going to do that. Don't talk about it, be about it. So it's that exact commonality, Jens, that you're talking about is the 100% reason you're on this with on here with us. It's because that commonality of putting in the work and doing the extra things is exactly what sets champions apart. You're willing to do more even when you don't want to do it. You, But it's a regimented thing. You said you bank it. You know, you get, kind of yep. go on autopilot because now it just becomes your part of your everyday process. So you're creating that habit. So, yep. so. I want to go back, dude, because we talk about, you know, using your failures to succeed as a part of this podcast. That requires coming, going over a, or going through a ton of adversity and getting through it. So I didn't know the extent of your story until you had said it when we were together in Georgia. And I want to go back, dude. And I know that um, I love hearing the passion pour out of you when you talk about this because it lets us know what Jens was feeling like at that age, but man, it started early for you on having to overcome adversity, which is a part of your history and a part of your big, your big goal. And I know it, so I don't want to share it with everybody because you're going to get to it, but let's go back, man, to when you were a kid, because you did not have the best childhood back in the state of Washington. Um, well, you know, I was lucky. I was lucky. I think I had, you know, I had, a, I was raised by a woman. I was raised by my mother. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You know what I mean? Like I said, when I was five years old, you know, my dad shoved a shotgun down my throat and said, choose. Choose who lives and who dies. And, you know, and then decided I wasn't worth the bullet, so he beat me with the back of the gun and then beat up my mother. And, you know, then we huddled together. And that's kind of how life was. And we always lived on eggshells. We were always nervous. And I remember, you know, I was always next to my mom where well, she would, she would come downstairs like, Jen, she helped me, Jen, she helped me. And, and I was like standing right there at five years old. I'll go running up six years old, seven years old, always going running up and, and, you know, and just defending my mom. Even if it's one shot that I take, that's one she didn't take. You know what I mean? And it wasn't until later on when I really realized what I was going to do in my life. And I told him, you know, it's when I started wrestling, I could see the, I could see people going up and congratulating my mom, I could see the smile in her face and I could see the pride in her face and people come up, man, your kids did well and something. And I was like, okay, I'm addicted to this. This is what I need to do. This is what I want to do. And so I had that, but outside of that, one day I do remember, you know, I'll never forget 
we got in the, in the bathroom, we got in a fight, and he beat me real bad. And I was like, you know, I go, one day, dude, one day I'm going to get so famous, I'm going to tell everybody about you. I'm going to create, I go, in a world, where, again, where your cars broke down on the side of the road and people drive on by, no fault of his own. They just, everybody has their own agenda. They've got their own deal. They got what they're doing. But for people to stop and give you their time, that's the greatest gift any one person can give is their time. So I'm going to get so famous that people, not only are they going to, they're going to want to meet me, they're going to wait in line to meet me. And that, to me, again, it's the most mind-boggling thing in the world, but that's what I set out to do. That's what I created, or that's what I started doing. And wrestling was that way. Yeah, and, you, and part beginning. of that was, too, is because that's the unfortunate way that your dad was, you're kind of like, yo, I'm going to call you out when I get there. And that's part of, was part of the driver for you, right? It, it was that, and I tell everybody, you know, there's that little thing that everybody needs. You need that little middle finger, that middle finger to something or someone that kind of will get you up off your ass on the days you don't want to get up. Obviously, we have we have a lot of days where you just got motivation, and it's just like, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to do this. And then there are just days where you just kind of just, again, you're on autopilot, and you're just going through the motions. And then there's just days where you're just like, ah, because no matter how hard I trained for a fight, and I'm trying to get myself ready. There's still the, the quote unquote, the real world and all kinds of different shit can happen that can knock you off your horse. You know what I mean? And knock you off and try to, so you got it. It's, it's good to have that middle finger to something. You don't let it beat you. You don't let it consume you and you damn sure don't let it make you become something else. But you just have that there going, there's this, uh, there's this middle finger to this one person you know, or that one individual that went again, for some people, it's obesity. It could be, you know, a, a health thing, whatever, got to have that middle finger. We got to have the contrast, the good and the bad, that kind of, that whatever it is, kind of the whole color of the rainbow that will get us up every day and get us through the shit, you know? Yep. Yep. And so, and, and you actually used it super early on because you went to, uh, to Homa, right? To Homa high school. Yep. Um, to Homa, yeah. Homa the bears. You know it. Uh, <laughs> Heck yeah. I think I think it was bears, right? No, so, it's the bears. Oh, it's the bears. Oh yeah, it's okay. bears. Um, not that I had. I just remember it from from reading. And then you, I don't remember if you told the story or not. But you started early on, then, man. I mean, I wrestled all. Um, I wrestled too, man. And it was a, a great sport. And I and I think that it, it it builds a lot of those things in you if you don't have them because of what it takes to be a wrestler. And it's kind of even though it's a team sport, you're on the map by yourself. So I loved it. I believe it's created a lot of the guy that I am today comes from those things. And my coach from my high school coach, who is still a, a dear friend of mine today and somebody I have super a super amount of respect for, who still has a flip bone, I believe. He refuses to take on technology, lives in the woods, chops his own wood. He's that kind of guy. Oh, man. Um, but you started off using that motivation in high school because when you got into wrestling, how did that go for you, Jens? Well, see, the thing was this, and I always had, I got into wrestling because, again, the one thing that I loved and what I realized was there was something about the team sports. I kept getting in trouble in these team sports, getting kicked off this team, this team. <laughs> I just, I'd have trouble with the coaches or whatever. But the thing about wrestling was, wrestling was you're out there and through the hard work, that's the only way, that's how you show your coaches, your fans, your friends. You know what I mean? Just by going out there and busting your ass, how much you appreciate them. There's no written word. You don't have to say anything to them. But for most people, that you've got the quarterback or whatever ripping their helmet off, doing whatever they can to stand out in front of the team. Where What I loved about wrestling, that one-on-one -on -one combative sport, is we're a bunch of individuals trying to be on a team, not a bunch of – not a team trying to be – not on a team trying to be an individual. Solid. And it. you see what I'm saying? And yeah. that's what I love. But it happened my sophomore year when I had to wrestle – I had I was I was unbeaten going into the final end of the final dual match, the final home match of my uh, of my season, and I got mopped. This guy crushed me eight to two. I mean, he just destroyed me, Lennox, man. And everybody was stunned. I'm like, oh. So then, like I said, all of a sudden I found myself okay. So the next week we're getting ready for the league tournament, and I'm like, oh my god, and we we made our way into the finals. He and I, and this time we're battling and. We're zero zero in the first round. Nobody can score a takedown. Second round, I get an escape, so I'm up one nothing. And then we go through the second round, third round. He, uh, oh no, sorry, I take it back. I take it back. Forgive me. Second round, I rode him out, so I was on top. I rode him out the entire second round. Nobody scored. Third round, I get the escape. So you're up one zero. And I'm up one nothing. And literally with like fifteen, ten, fifteen seconds, I still remember he shot in ten, nine, eight, seven, six, two takedown, boom, two one, and he beats me. 
two to one. <laughs> and he becomes the Puget Sound Wrestler of the Year. And he was, everybody was jumping up and down. He was going crazy. And he made this article. He did this. Uh, and my coach brought me the, the, the article. And it said, you know, Jens Pover is a young gun coming up. He was a senior. I was a sophomore. He's a young gun coming up. But right now it's my turn. And he's going to have, he's just going to have to wait in line. And my coach came to me. I'm going, nah, man, this is my dream. I'm like, I'm not waiting in line for nothing. I'm not waiting in line for nobody. You know, and so I started learning about that. There's things about working with people and stuff like that. But when you have your goal and other people are on the same mountain and stuff like that, it's not rude to try to knock them out, but you got to achieve your goal. And I'm like, you know, hey, I get it. But he, it's like, oh, yeah, all right. So here I am. I work my butt off, work my butt off all week. And now we're at regional. And so here we go. Same thing. We go to the regional tournament, boop, 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 crush everybody. And I still remember, I remember looking at my mom going, I'm not going to lose again. I go, I will not lose the third time. And I, in my mind, I'm going through these weeks of training, this week of training, and I'm trying to figure out what I got to do, what little things I got to do. These matches are so close. Anyway, so now we meet ourselves and we're in for the, uh, we're at the regional finals. Here we go. He and I, boom, we start wrestling again. And I remember I, he gets a point, he gets a point. Now this time, I start getting in, and now it's we're one to one, and boom, I shoot in short time. Boom, I take him down, bam, and I end up I'm up by one, and I beat him, and I get the double. Yeah, now baby. I'm winning, and then I end up winning three to one, something like that. I mean, it's been a long time ago, so I was like 16 years old, so <laughs> I don't know the exact score, but I, it was like three to one or something like that. So I scored the takedown in the third round, and then I got the win. Immediately, I seen the tears in my mom's eyes. And this is really at a bad time. This is still when the, when the divorce and the separation with my father, and all that shit was going on. And you know I mean, so all this shit was happening. This is when he, he cleaned me out and we got in a fight on the freeway where he beat me up in the back of the van and like, we can get all these things, but I got to go out there and when I did this match and I seen all the, the just the excitement, the coaches, everybody screaming, my mother in tears, my brothers in tears and everybody just jumped. I'm like, I was addicted. I'm like, this is it. I know what I'm going to do. I'm putting my family, this is how I'm, this, this is what I'm going to do. And then next, you know, here we go. The next weekend, we're in the damn state tournament. They had all three single A, double A, and triple A all at the Tacoma Dome and 25,000 plus. And the way it works is they put one mat each. So we've got the, the double A, the single A, double A, and triple A mat for each weight class. And they start with the 101. And nobody rep until when the one-on-one's all finished, here comes the next weight class. They'll all wrestle. You wait till everybody's done, then the next weight. So they don't, they, none of the weight, they all start at the same time. Sure as shit, man. Boom, boom, We smashed everybody. And here we go. He and I. Now, everybody has started figuring out how badass this rivalry is. We're literally beating each other by just one takedown. Now you've got everybody getting this. I, it makes me wish, like, could you imagine – the Facebooks and just, I mean, this is still just newspaper stories. You know what I mean? But it just reminds me, man, if we had this back, this would have been nuts. So, but people started really following us. Like, dear God, these two are going at it. So here we go again. And boom, we're in the final. And I still remember going out there and then we just go at it. And what I really remember more than anything is at the end, I get this tilt. And I remember sitting there and I get these two near fall and I get end up on top. And I look up and I see my team jumping. I see his team jumping. And I'm like, and I'm not understanding what's <laughs> happening. I'm like, did I win? Did I lose? I don't know what happened. And I ended up, I tied it up. So it's so fitting because now here you go. Now they did see back then it was still, it wasn't sudden death. It was three one minute rounds. Okay. Got it. So they used to do sudden death. First one to score wins the match. Right. right? right well, this yeah. is still three one minute rounds. And so here we are. It's now it's just he and I. No other matches can start. All the other matches are done. 25,000 plus, like it should be. He and I, three one-minute rounds to find out who's about to be the state champion. And, and then off we go. And we start wrestling. And I still remember being so focused. I can remember this because I was so oblivious to time. When I, had, when I turned him over and got that near fall, my team starts, my team starts jumping up and down. I'm thinking, oh, I won. And I got up, I'm like, I, I must have won because they're all excited. <laughs> I didn't realize I was down four points. So getting the reversal and getting the two back points tied it up. I'm like, but I was so in the match, like, I, I didn't realize I was behind. Anyway, so here we go. I score the points, and all of a sudden, I just remember short time, short time, boom. I ended up beating him and becoming the state champion. Love it. And 
it was the craziest thing in the world. And why I tell that story, and one of the things is I remember right afterwards, once I got off the floor and I went running, I, I went running up through the stairs, all the way up the balcony, all the way around, and right into my mom's arms. And I can't, I'm a, I don't think, I, I should not cry this time. So, I'm a, I'm a kid, but, <laughs> so, but what it reminded me of is just like that little five-year-old kid when my dad beat me with the butt of the gun and my mother tried to defend me, we fought for each other, and I went, and she, I went diving into her arms. And she was making me, you know, helping me where when we got in the fight in that van on the freeway, my mother was cleaning me up in the bathroom and wiping all the blood off me and apologizing. And then here we are. And I got to do this. And now we're crying. And, you know, I mean, and, and I got to see this, this pride and everything. And it's like the same kid. I just running back to my mama. You know what I mean? My mommy. I went <laughs> mama. Straight to it. See, I, I'm loaded. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm lumping up. But yep. and that's when I, just, I knew after that, I was like, this, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to lift up my family. And this is how I'm going to give us, you know, the ability to travel and stories. And so that's when I, that's when the bug set in. Yep. I wasn't the best wrestler, but after college, I'm like, what am I going to do? And I started punching people I'm like, well, all right. And this MMA thing, I like this. This is wrestling <laughs> with training wheels. And, and so we just went down this road. And next thing you know, you know, I end up, I become the UFC, the first ever world champion at 155 pounds, which is the weight class that I started. And so, but it carried me on this gigantic journey. So, and Jens, let me hop in for a second. Let me hop in for a second. So, um, because I don't want to miss some of that. Now, one thing that I, I've, I loved about you is that you are an empathetic dude. So the fact that you well up is because you can, you, that feeling that you got of giving your mom a hug comes from a lot of adversity you had to overcome and the things you went through. And, but also it's the fight you had to go through and the monotonous day to day. Like you're talking about the three little pig story. It's all that day to day stuff that you did to become the best that got you there. And then that feeling of that moment comes back to you when you tell that story, which is why you yeah. start to well up. And, and a lot of, businesses lack empathy. So I want to, I want to express how important I believe that is because emotion can also create action. And that emotion for you was a, was a driver. And when you tell the story, it gives me goosebumps no different today <laughs> than it did when you said it the last time. And I already knew about it. So, yeah. so, but it's not like, Hey, yo, Jens Pulver just become state champ. Cause it, you, did you win twice? I ended up becoming a two time state champion and a runner up. See, I started running into, I started running into things and I, and, Later, in the very beginning of my life, I, I, I wasn't good. And this is something that carried with me for a long time. And I'm just getting better at it now is I, when good things happen, I get really scared. I get really nervous. And a lot of people I'm sure can figure it out in business and stuff like that too is the worst thing. Now here I am the two time state champion and now everybody's gunning at me or just like when I was the world champion, I climbed the top of the mountain. Now everybody is gunning at me and what happened because somewhere in my childhood, whenever we had that smile on our face and it just depends how pissed off my dad was or how bad a day he was having, he would just drill you and just bust you up because you were smiling for no other reason because they're not. And it makes me think about just how people in the world you got to deal with is there are people out there that they just see a smile on your face and they don't have one. They don't care why you're smiling. They don't care what happened. They just want to see you not have one. They just want to see you knock. They just want to knock that smile off your face. And he was one of those guys. So I was really afraid. And there was a part where I felt like either a, I was being too braggadocious or I was, you know, I, I, I like to say that, but you know what I mean? So <laughs> That's braggadocious. A polarism. But, you know I mean? Right. Yeah, it is. And the other thing is it's just, or, being confident, but it always scared me because I'm always waiting for that other shoe to drop because there was always that other shoe dropping for a long time in my life. So I had a really hard time. So there's a lot of people, you know, some that it's like, well, you don't want to hold on to too much. You know how they always say, stay grounded. Yep. Don't go, don't yep. go too high up into the sky and, and forget where you came from and stuff like that. But at the same token, and where I love about Jesse and build your life resume and stuff like that is see one of the things that from a kid, long before I met Jesse, the spiritual life resume was, I was, I need to fill my book. I need to fill my book, my chapters, because I told everybody that's one of the things that I carried with me through high school to college was stories. When I got on that train and I, I traveled on that train for two and a half days and showed up in Iowa with two duffel bags, one with training gear, one with regular clothes in Iowa, I mean, freezing cold Iowa. And I was like, I want to be a world champion. But I had to because this was the road that I was going to go down. 
because I wasn't done with that middle finger. I wasn't done being quote unquote famous. I wasn't done making my mother proud. You know what I mean? Making my brothers proud, my sister proud, making my family proud of who we being a pulver, you know? And that was the one thing that showed for me having that and the passion and everything like that, putting that all together, taking the train and being scared, but just getting out there and making it happen. You know what I mean? Sorry, I'm going long. But- no, man, that, the transition from, so you're kind of going into it. The transition from being, you know, a two-time state champ and a runner-up um, is, is one hell of an accomplishment that it's the small percent ever accomplish. So then you make that transition going into like, yo, I like this. I'm going to keep this thing going. And you go into um, mixed martial arts and going through all that. It's a great segue because with that comes a new set of things you got to overcome, but you still have that same commonality of your work ethic and like your, well, you got and, to, go ahead. Well, what I'd say, and the other thing is, and again, but I still had that, I hear I had this drive yet. I still have this fear. I still have this fear of when you get to that top and it's like, so I still have that constantly driving, you know what I mean? Same thing with the rest. And when I lost my third time, it's like, I just wasn't ready. Every time something good happened, I've always had that. So I've always, that was the other middle finger that was always chasing me. That was always the, the skeleton in the past that it, would, it never allowed me to be happy. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad, I'm not sure because some people with complacency, I believe, but you know, I mean? but I, I never had that, but I also never allowed myself to enjoy what I was doing. And that's what I was saying. So when I got on that train, and I went out there to become a world champion. I knew I wanted, I mean, I wasn't done building that name and I wanted to see my family smile. But every time I did good things, it was such a catch 22 because I was so afraid to, to, to enjoy it. Yeah. I was scared because I kept waiting because that's the eggshells that my father taught me that I had to walk on in life because I didn't know. Like I said, I'm riding the bike as a kid, just bam, just blast me. He would see that smile and he just wanted to Gosh. knock it off my face. He didn't have one, you know what I mean? Or, and, or to get woke up in the middle of the night screaming because he was so mad or he would hear us having a good time watching the Seattle Seahawks or whatever it was. And then he just had to make sure that he just dumped on us. And everybody deals with that. Now in this day and age, in the social world especially, I feel for our youth. I feel for everybody because everybody's so much more applicable. You can get a hold of them through these, through these apps. You know what I mean? You can, these social media is that everything is an opinion. Everybody has one. And you start to feel that and understand that more, especially in the work world where you, you know, again, you're out there trying to do the best you can. You're out there trying to provide a great product, but it's sometimes some people just, you know what I mean? It's got, it's tough. Like being a coach and anything that we do, customer service or anything of that nature, entertainment, anything that we do is, it's again, man, it's just, it's really hard. So when I went out there, like I said, that's where I, when I was on that train in Iowa. So I always had that. I was always afraid of, again, I'll wrap it back. I'll bring it on back down. Bring it on I was in. always, yeah, right. But I was always afraid of, I had that middle finger, which kept me going. And it allowed me to argue with myself, which was the scared little boy that's still in there. It's like, I'm afraid of the attention. I'm afraid of people coming around. I'm afraid of being at the top of the mountain because everybody's staring at us. But then you've got this other side that's like, nah, man, we got to do this. We're going to keep going. So I always told people, I kept knocking myself off the mountain because I started going after the climb would be the Miley Cyrus. It's the climb, <laughs> but the climb. And that's the thing is you get a lot of people that okay, they're really you, good about. Little, could you sing a little verse of that for us, please? Nah, you don't want to hear me. Do that. You know, do that. I got but, you. you know, but it's, yeah, right. But it's that climb that I got addicted to that climb and always pulling myself out of the shit. I would yeah. land in the shit, but I couldn't sit in there and it would be up there. But when I got to the top, that was the other problem. I wasn't good up there either. So it's trying to find that happy medium in between. Yeah, dude. So, um, what I heard you say too, and you're getting into some really, really good stuff there is, um, like if you heard the, in the introduction of this podcast, we talk about, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Um, uh, yeah. I believe that because even when you're at the top, you cannot get complacent. You have to continue no. to get better because somebody else is coming for you always. And so you use some of that fear as your motivator to get you to, you know, world champ or to get you to state champ. So everybody deals with that, man. And matter, no matter what you do, everybody deals with some sort of fear. So a motivator can, can, can manifest itself in, in multiple ways. It could be that you just really want to hit X goal. It could be like, I don't want to fail this. Or somebody says you can't do it. And then you want to prove them wrong. Yep. So all those motivators can come from different places, but that's um, everybody has some somewhere if you actually want to accomplish something. But my 
one of my biggest fears would be regret. I don't want to regret not trying something. So I'm okay with sticking my neck out, and if it fails, you fix it and you move on, and you don't do that again, or you get make it better. And failing's part of the of the climb, man. Like you talked about, like you got like there's some of that's going to happen, and it's how you react to that failure that starts to separate you from everybody else. So what I want to I want to um, talk about with you is you really kind of downplayed your UFC stuff because um, we didn't get into it too much. So I'm just going to bring up a, a couple of quick things that, that really stand out to me. Um, and what's interesting about this is if I would have fast forwarded back to, or I should say rewinded back to when I was watching Jens Pulver fight, um, never would I have pictured myself here this, you know, many years later, you know, talking to you about it. But what's cool is it stuck with me. So if anybody has followed UFC, even you know, early on, it was watching, um, man, there were some amazing, amazing talent in, in early UFC. And it was great between, you know, um, you know, Hughes, you have Penn, you have, I mean, so like the guys that, you know, and Hughes was a, you know, Hughes was a wrestler too, right? But Penn was a jiu-jitsu guy, right? Yeah. Or mixed martial arts. But, yeah. But your fight yeah. against Penn, and I want to talk about this because I know you're going to go off, but I won't forget, you guys, like, you guys went at it for four rounds, you know, um, try, you know, Penn won you on the ground a lot. He wants you on the ground because he's trying to get you where he, you know, where he's best at. He, what, doesn't he hyper extend your arm in an arm bar or something like that? Was it, I was that in fourth round? He got, so what happened, no, it was, it was a five round fight and we were the first ever 155 pound division. We were at the, at the Mohegan Sun. And, um, I still remember it, it was crazy. There was all kinds of, the, the fact that this fight happened, they talked about it all the time because there was, there was this food poison going through and people were getting violently ill. To this day, I still feel so bad for Dave Monet. He had to defend his world title, and I felt so bad because my man was literally on the on the shitter, <laughs> diarrhea one end, throwing up into a garbage can at the same time. He literally just wiped off his mouth like, all right, I guess I'll go out there and fight. A lot of people, luckily, they got sick a little earlier or whatever it was. But see, I never left my room, and BJ, he went to a different hotel because when we were on the plane, I was way too confident. and It was driving him nuts. It drove him nuts because – I was smiling, having a good time. I was hanging with Matt and Jeremy and Militech and everybody and Tony Franklin. And we were just, I was having way too much fun. Medina was with me and stuff, and, and, and it freaked him out. He's like, shouldn't, isn't he, he should be scared. He's fighting me. I'm the best there is. And it's like, so, but to go out there. So in the second round, first off, I was a battle. In the second round, he got this arm bar right at the end. And everybody, the, the whole they were yelling that he tapped, he tapped. And I didn't tap. He, he got it out. So like literally, I knew, but I knew how much time was up because I could hear my corner counting. Big John could hear us. So he knew that I could hear. And that's why BJ's battling, battling. I'm doing everything I can to try to hold on. Four, three, two, one. And he's got to extend it. I'm like, and I go, and then I hear the bent. And I go, get him off me. And I punch his leg. And that's what everybody was yelling, tap. But see why McCarthy didn't even jump on it because he hurt. I go, get him the, off my arm because he was still kind of, ah, he battled for you. so long. And he wanted to kind of just hold on to it for a minute like, ah, and I'm like, get him the fuck off my arm, part of my language. And that's why I slapped it. But that's where Crazy Bob's like, he tapped, he tapped. And I'm like, I didn't tap. So now I get up and I'm sitting there and I, I'm, I'm wrecked. I get up off the ground. I'm like, this is killing me. I got Militich and Jeremy, everybody buzzing in my ear and I'm just going, I'm just looking down at the cameras going, he got that so fast. When he got me to the ground, he hit that arm bar so quick. He controlled me so easy. It's like, this is terrible. I'm like, what am I? I'm going to literally get up, walk back out here, and he's going to take me down and submit me so fast. This is stupid. I'm like, this is, I go, what, man? And I was beat. John. So you, and I so you remember, actually mentally had to check yourself going into that third round. Oh, I got mental check. Remember <laughs> that middle finger we talking about? I see somebody with a Hawaiian flag jumping up and down. Through the cage, just past BJ, and I go, and he starts going like this. He looks at me, he's doing his cutthroat, and he flips me off. He does the cutthroat, and I'm like, ding. <laughs> and I go, pardon my language, and I say this, so I go, oh, fuck him. <laughs> I go, and I point, I go, fuck you. And I got so mad. I was like, forget him. I looked at Pat, I looked at him, I'm like, and they're like, what are you doing? I go, get away from me. I go, I, I go I'm pissing, and that dude's Cheerios right there. Oh, I was so mad. I'm like, I'm in here busting my ass, and this dude's going to sit out there and flip me off like I'm some kind of joke. Thus, the middle finger. I never lost another second of that fight, period. Not one minute, not one take, not nothing. Yep. Cause I seen, but I had to work on a look and I seen that. And it's again, 
what happens is this. Every now and then when you get that pause, you have that moment. It's like sometimes we can let it just keep spiraling us down. But if you just stop and take that pause for a second and look around and find that, take a deep breath or whatever it is. And it's like, okay, find that middle finger, find your drive, whatever it is. And then boom. And then I never looked back. And I remember going up to my man after I said, Dude, I was wrecked. It wasn't for you. And I said, thank you. <laughs> and he's like, he's all mad at the time. I'm like, thank you, because I was beat. I mean, I was ruined. But it's, like I said, that's sometimes, you know, and, and whatever whatever we do in life, sometimes it just gets hard, man. And you're just like, why? There's, what am I, what's the point? Literally, what is the point? And you got to be able to stop and look and focus for a minute and just find something. Find that little baby step. Like, all right, I've got this. And let that start to get you going and let that start to become the motivation, the momentum, the ability to, like I said, pushing that rock up the hill. It's one step at a time, boom. But you got to find these little things keep going. Right. And then once yep. you get over that hop and then boom, and then it starts flowing. And that's the one thing it doesn't matter. And I start realizing again, that's universal because there's always people or not people. There's always situations or something that's going to be like, and you're like, all right, well, again, that's that middle finger. It's like, well, eh, no way. Yep. You know what I mean? And sometimes it's with yourself or sometimes with someone else. But I still remember of all the, the moment of clarity, what? And I mean, I remember looking going, what? And I, <laughs> all right, I'll be on that dude, Cheerios, right there. <laughs> and the one thing you said about, you know, when it comes to where I became a real fan of guys that had these big, long winning streaks that have maintained and held on to their belts for these big, long runs, you know, it's it, how they were able to develop that. And I didn't start learning it till later. It's like, you know, there's motivation behind going out there going, you think you're good enough to beat me? Shit. Now I'm going to, now I'm going to just show you. And to people that have that, <laughs> and it, it gives them that extra work. And that's, that's the work. For me, I always needed some kind of, you know, someone telling me I can't do it, piss me off. And I, again, climbing the hill. But when I got up to that top, I never learned how to be comfortable there. You know what I mean? And that's the one thing I think for anybody it's when you get there. I didn't learn it until later. It's like, now you go out there and you go, and not in a rude way. It's like, you think you can beat me? You think you train like I do? You run like I do? You lift like I do? You work like we do? You have a product that we have? I'm going to show you why it's not that easy. And then you go out, there, you know what I mean? But I was always the emotional kid that had to have the, the fire, you know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, man. But you know what? The, the saying is, you know, the guy at the top of the mountain didn't fall there. So, yeah. So, and that's, yeah, I like, hell yeah, I like that one. So, like that. so, so it takes so, Jen, <laughs> Yeah. So, so, Jens, I want to go back to when you were a little boy. So, obviously, you carried that little middle finger with you for a long time where you said you promised to your dad that you would make sure everyone else, you know, knew how he treated your family. You had that moment. And when that moment came, then did you have to come up with another middle finger? Was that healing? Did that change your mindset as you prepared for that next phase in life? I never won another. I, I barely won a fight after. And what happened was this. So it wasn't even after I won the world title, I wasn't done. The sport was still small. It hadn't really blown up. But when I did the ultimate fighter and the minute that show aired, I mean, I had neighbors like, wait, you're, you're that, wait, that, that, you, that's you. <laughs> like, and then all of a sudden it literally the next day. Boom. I'm like, Oh, so this is what it feels like to be quote unquote popular. Season All five? right, I get this. I don't like. I don't say famous, huh? Was that season five? Season five. five. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. You and five, you and yep. B, you and BJ. And team ten versus team Pulver. Oh, yeah, baby, yeah. I'm a winner that with one. Nate Diaz. So I had Nate Diaz and Manny Gambiri in, in the finals, and Corey Hill, rest in peace, was on my team, and so it was a great. It was a great show. But and that's when I started like. Uh, that's when. Okay, the, the quote unquote popularity came in. I don't like saying famous. I'm not famous. The famous people, man, they rich and famous. I'm not that. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's the popularity, whatever. But the reality, and that's when someone said, hey, do you want to make this documentary? When I made that documentary driven, that's when I succeeded. Which you I get on finished Amazon. what I set out to do, I finished what I started to do. And after that, see, my wife, I had my wife and my kids. And what scared me was I was so afraid to be that same intense dude. I was so afraid to be my, my father. And I was a really intense little son of a bitch when I was first training and, you know, I mean, hell bent. And, you know, I mean, what else? If you didn't have that kind of intensity. What would put you on a train for two and a half days to go to a place you never want to go to? Iowa, freezing ass cold Iowa. I'm from Seattle. I don't want to go to Iowa. And I left everything that I know. 
Well, something drove me. Something pissed me off. I showed up with two bags. I'm like, I got to do this. You know what I mean? This is, I was kept, again, fill my book. Go out there and get uncomfortable. And that's where I really relate with Jesse. You know what I mean? I wanted to fill my book, fill my chapters, fill my chapters. Always go out there and build these stories. And because remember, at the end of the day, that's all you're left with. Right. Our story to pass on to the generation and will people want to listen to them? Are you in a position where people will hear them? And that's what I set out to do was to get so big that people would take the time to see this movie. And it wasn't until he called one day and went, good God, son, how famous are you? And I'm like, why? He like, man, I can't go anywhere. I said, I told you. I, said, I told you. You know, and because the one thing I left out is when I beat BJ Penn and I got that win, Four hours later, I got so violently ill, it finally got a hold of me. I never left my room except the train getting to go into that fight. So I got lucky and didn't get sick until four hours after I got so violently ill. It was, it was, the, it was horrid. It was three days of the most, a lot of them, they got early enough to go to the hospital or whatever. I mean, and the ones in the middle, so this flu bug, it was unreal, whatever this was. And I remember my father called me. And what happened was they'd asked me a question. When he had you in the mount and he was punching on you, were you nervous? And my words were, what? I go, my father's been beating me since I was a kid. Those punches weren't shit. Well, he was sitting somewhere watching the fight. And it took him a few hours to get nice and drunk. And then he called me. And he left the message. And I answered. I said, let me guess. I go, let me guess. You were sitting there. With all your fans going, that's my boy. I made him that way. I made him tough. I made it. I go, let me tell you something, man. I go, you didn't do shit. You didn't. I go, my mother made me tough. My brothers and my sister, they made me Shout tough. Shout out to moms. I, man, I said, I go, my mom made me tough. I said, I didn't do this. I go, you don't deserve this. You don't deserve to take credit for this. You don't deserve to watch this. You shouldn't even have been watching this. And then he's like, you little son of a bitch, when I see you, I'm going to kill you. So that's what happens. I beat BJ Penn. I got my father. Once again, it goes back to what I was saying is here I should be experiencing this high of highs. And I'll, and as I got up there, I'm like, when's the shoe going to drop? Well, he made sure to make that phone call and throw that fucking, pardon my language, and throw that rock on my head and knock my ass down. We all go through that shit. No matter what we're doing, it doesn't have to be your dad, but there's just people in general, man. The more I've learned, the more famous I've got. I, I created this little story, and it's a long way. Ten people. Four want to knock that smile out the face because they don't have They don't give a shit why. They don't care. They just want to knock it out the face because they don't. They, and you go into these chat rooms and stuff like, you know, and, and, and the people can, the Q&As, and people can leave all these comments. Go look at how many of them are negative comments. Not that many are good. You know what I mean? Then you've got, and again, I say four more that are kind of like give you the high five back. Hey, all right. But behind your back, you're like, man, fuck that guy. Where's mine? Why does he get to do this? Man, where's mine? I want to know. But they look at you and go, huh, awesome, dude. Love you. And then you got two. And I'm being generous when I say two. Two that literally walk up to you and they're just happy because you're happy. They just love you because you're, you're, you're doing well. And that's something I've learned throughout this. And that's why I always use my 10. Obviously, there's more. But to me, that's, and that's something I've learned. There's two that are just genuinely happy because you are. Well, my father made sure to teach me that a long time ago. Here I was. I just beat BJ Penn. We were the first ever lightweights to do a main event. All right. At 155 pounds, the division that I started, this guy crushed everybody. In fact, to prove how dangerous he was, the five rounds, when they went to Japan and got Cal Uno and said, that's who you're fighting, the best 155-pounder on the planet. And I beat him in five rounds. BJ knocked him out in 30 seconds. So, and he's, and he's the best on the ground. He's the jujitsu wizard. He's the American black belt first one to go out there and win a world title in jujitsu. And he's knocking people out standing up. So, again, to be an 8-1 to underdog and to have that, you know what I mean? But then, again, when I should have had that high, here's my father calling and letting me know that he was going to kill me when he sees me. So, again, you know what I mean? So Rock that's full circle. Yeah. Rock and that's so when I made this movie and stuff, when he called and he said, I go, I told you. I go, this isn't for you. I told you what I was going to do to you. And I told you that this was going to happen one day. After that, though, I said, look, now that I'm done, I go, now we can learn how to be friends. And we started talking. And I told him, I go, you can never be around my family. You can never be around my kids or me because, you know, 
you started talking to me the way that you used to. You spoke to my wife or my kids the way you used to talk to me. You'll snap me back to that ninth grader, and I'm in a position that I'd I'd wreck you so fat, you, I'd kill you, <laughs> and you would you would win because I'd be taken away from my family. Not being serious, I'm so sorry. I told him, I go, you can never be around me, but I go, I'll talk to you. You can call me any day, every day, any time, and I'll answer the phone. So we started mending that bridge. So like I said, to the end here, where I had to learn, I wasn't good at just being a fighter anymore because I didn't have that middle finger and I was afraid of being some crabby ass, nasty individual. And I never wanted to be that way to my wife. I mean, I damn sure would never want to be that way to my kids. So I didn't know how to just be a fighter to just be for the fun of the sport. Again, I didn't have that. And so it's something I was always trying to work on. So anyways, later on in life here, a couple of years, two years ago now, I believe, I got that phone call. And I'm like, yeah. And I answered it. And I was in the store and I said, yo, this is so-and-so from the coroner's office. I'm like, ooh, ooh, stop, stop. I go, hold on, please. I go, don't say it. I go, don't say it. I go, I'm in public. And she goes, look, I know I've seen the documentary. I know who you are. I know your relationship with your father, but you, you, your father passed away last night in a, in a house fire. And I was like, what? I'm like, what? And it tried to start talking. Now I've got tears. And I'm standing in the middle of Walmart going, ah, I'm crying. And all these people are looking at me now. My wife's like, get, get, get your ass to the car. I'm like, ah, ah. So I take off right, right out the door. I go, I'm sitting in the car and I'm talking to Sage. She goes, look, I know your situation. I know your relationship with your father. But I'm like, well, what made you? I go, why did you call me? She goes, I had to call you because you're the only phone number he had in his phone. Oh, man. And that says a lot because when I started out as a kid, and I told him one day I'm gonna get so famous, you know. I mean, now that he's gone, I I literally think back. I'm like, you know, I if I could wake him up, I'd tell him thank you, because if it wasn't for him and this middle finger, I wouldn't have traveled the world. I wouldn't be sitting here doing this with you all right now, with the the family of my dreams, my daughter, my babies. You know, I mean, it's just it's I wouldn't have what I have, and I and I'm so thankful that. You know, I couldn't change anything. The losses, the bumps. And so my message now, like what you heard when we were talking with this, is, you, you know, once you can find it and learn how to be your own best friend first and you can smile, like I'm so thankful where I'm at right now that it's, I wouldn't change anything. Any of those losses, because people ask me all the time, well, what would you do? Would you, is there a loss you'd go back and change? I'm like, no, I can't. Like, what do you mean? I go, because if any one win or any one loss or any one thing would have changed, I wouldn't have been walking oh, yeah. through that airport, right? I wouldn't have been walking through that airport eight hours late. She was six hours late, delayed on her flight, going through the hard rock when the cabbie made a mistake and took her to the casino when she wanted to go to the restaurant. And all of a sudden, we walk right by and boom, the red bow. I just like, I know you. And I'm like, oh, no. she goes, you're James Fulver. I'm like, I know you. But I go, nothing. And I've got the first 10 seconds. My wife, here we are 12 years later. Like I said, if Love any it. one thing would have changed. You see what I mean? So yep. what I try to, what the story that I want people to understand is like we hold on to these things okay. and we use them and utilize them, but we can't let them beat us. And we got to utilize it. And, and so if you can be happy with who you are right now, and that's the whole idea is learn how to be your own best friend first. And you can accept it. it allows you to deal with the bumps and maybe you don't hang your head so much. And that was the thing about with my father is I was so happy with the idea that we were friends and we did talk on the phone. He could call drunk and angry and I would listen to him and I could hear the regret in his, in his voice, you know what I mean? And stuff like that. And there was a part of me. He's like, people always ask, why aren't my your kids taking care of you? And this and that. I'm going, dude, I mean, you, you won't stop drinking. And the person you are, there's no way I could have you around me because you would win. And I can't be you. And I don't want to be you. Right. You know what I mean? Dude, I think that, um, one, thanks for sharing. I think that actually is a great way to kind of start to segue out, out of that because that's another thing that I think a lot of people have to do is let it go. Not forget it. Let it go and move on. And don't let that deter you from whatever you're trying to accomplish. You can't focus you know, there's no, people will say there's no future in the past. Um, you can't, you know, worry about building the tallest building, not burning the other buildings down. You know, yeah. so, so use these things for good because when you look in the mirror, that's your biggest enemy, man. Like, you got to let shit go, but you also got to keep every day 
chipping away, doing whatever it takes to get you to the next step. If you own a business, a technician quits, you got to go start looking for another one. It's the how it goes. If you have a financial issue, you got to work through it. What you can't do is nothing. You got to accept it. You got to put a plan in place and then you got to follow that plan. If that means you got to check fucking boxes every single day to make you feel good, then that's what you got to do. So um, I want to real quick just say the world gets to experience Jen's pulver because of what your dad brought to you. So I'm going to flip that a little bit because you said you wouldn't have been able to do these things without your dad. We wouldn't have been able to experience you or this story without, without him. God rest his soul. But I'm so grateful to hear like you're able to put that shit aside and then move on with Jen's pulver. It drove you. It was your motivator when it needed to be your no motivator, and it worked. But then you can move on because you want to be Jens Pulver and you want to be in the position you're at right now. If one thing would have went different, you wouldn't be where you are. We wouldn't be doing this. So I respect that because you stuck to yourself and who you are and who you want to be, and you use different motivators to get it done. So I appreciate that very much. And I want to, before we go real quick, because you you'd mentioned Driven, um, I believe you can get driven on Amazon, but I want to give you an opportunity to just to, you're doing some pretty cool stuff. And I've been watching some of your uh, YouTube videos and the striking Viking guy and all that stuff. But real yeah. quick, just give us a pitch so our listeners can say like, dude, I love this guy. Like I want to get, you know, want to consume a little bit more of Jen's pulver. What can these guys do to, to, to find uh, more of Jen's pulver? You know, the, so the one thing is Twitch TV slash Jen's pulver. And I usually start, I go Wednesday through Sunday because it's hard talking, man. But, so I go at <laughs> nine o'clock at night because I got, again, I got to make sure my babies, you know, my they, they're obviously they, they're 12 and eight right now, 11 and eight right now, but I still call them my babies. And so I got to make sure that they got, everything's ready. And then they're winding down the last half an hour before they go to bed for school and stuff. So I start at nine o'clock and I'm up till like two in the morning and I love it. What I started doing, I was playing video games at first, but then the more comfortable, the more I got comfortable and started having fun, this became my passion because I get to do the one thing that I missed more than anything about retiring. And this is a tough moment, but I, I remember saying when I was retiring, like, well, what am I going to do now, mom? It's like, what I go, and I was sober when I go, I spent my whole career just trying to make you guys have fun and laugh. And you know what I mean? I wanted, we went on these wild places. My brother always says, I got to see things I'd have never seen if you wouldn't have, you know what I mean? The journey. I got through this journey and I was so scared. I'm like, what am I going to do now? And she's like, just watching you be a kick-ass husband and a, and a good father is big enough, you know? And But the one thing that I missed and this, this stream brought to me was the interaction. People giving me their time and I tell them all the time, it's the one gift. You can never get it back. Money can't buy it. It's the most precious thing you can do. And the fact that people give me their time not only do they give me their time, they will sit there and hang out with me for a few hours or however long they do or when people used to wait in line. The greatest gift in the world. And I'm like, I'm so thankful. So what it did is it allowed me to find my passion, which is, and all of a sudden that brought me back to going around fighting. I got around street beefs and I got to see these young kids that are in their guns down, gloves up, trying to do the best that they can, give them a platform where they can, they're not pro fighters or anything like that, but what it is is, they're not scared and jumping each other, 10 people beating up one or getting in a situation where they got to get a gun. So like that. So they're just getting familiar with the, with the idea of fighting. It's like a fight club, but we're all, and we're fighting each other. And the reason is I'm not having them. Remember, I stopped fighting the day I started fighting. The day I went pro, I never fought a day in my life because there was another reason for what I was doing. So I want people to understand is I'm not teaching these kids how to become these quote unquote pit bulls, run around, attack everything. We're actually giving them a platform and a place to do it. And it allows all these little alpha males and females to test each other and stuff like that. So once I got around that, now it's like, all right, well, I'm going to start breaking these fights down. And, and now it's like, I'm your world champion in a pocket. So now we do, we watch a lot of fights on the stream and, and I'm the pause king. And in yes. fact, we just came up with this thing yesterday. You never know where the pause is going to take you because I'll pause for one second because somebody will say something in chat and then boom, God knows where it goes. I've got four other fights up. We're watching this. We're breaking this down. Half an hour later, I'm like, oh, wait. And then we're back to where we started. So that's like, I always tell people, you never know where the pause is going to take you. So it's a lot of fun. But that's my thing is Twitch TV slash Jens Pulver is giving me that platform to do, you know, like I said, it's my version of a podcast. I still try to play some video games and stuff like that. And the one thing I did say about the comfort zone, I want people to understand is, you know, is learning how to, what I learned this thing is learn how to be your own best friend first. And this is an ageless this is ageless, all right? Because there was a moment when I'm like, man, 
Norman, like I said, you can see what these flames look like behind me with everything is working. And I'm like, yes, this thing looks amazing. What I've learned a lot is, you know, I, I, I can be humble and it's okay. It's okay to have little technical difficulties happen because here I am with this green screen. At first I was like, hey, you, you think I'm playing? At first I'm like, see, I'm postponing. This ain't happening. <laughs> and then I'm like, you know what? The heck with it. Because again, learn how to be your own best friend first. And I'm still learning. Learn how to say enough positives in your life to yourself that when somebody does that doesn't know you comes in or something happens, that it, it just boom and you recover. You don't just hit the floor and you stay there. And now you got to figure out how to get out of there. And that's what happens to a lot of kids. We say so much negative shit to ourselves that for some reason we think that it's okay. I used to say things to myself that if you were to say that to my wife or kids, I'd, I'd hurt you. You know what I mean? But why is it okay that I would say it, that I can say it to me? And that's the message that I'm literally out there every day. I want people to understand Respect. no matter what that we work and what we do is learn how to be your own best friend first. It's like anything else that we do. Remember what I said, get out there and fill your autopilot, the mundane, the drill, the drill, the drill, the drill. Well, every day we got to wake up and I got to say, you know what, dude, you ain't too bad. You know what? You're all right. You know what? You can do this. You know what? We're going to do this today. You know what? start telling yourself the same shit like a diet if that's what you're after a routine that you're always after and start making that become a part of your habit and like that i don't believe in addictions i believe in habits and we can adjust these habits and every day it's like little baby steps to create those habits and once we do now we have filled our autopilot and we're doing shit on like i said when i get hit really hard and i'm unconscious i fought for a minute and a half one time i had no idea what i was doing well, i won a wrestling match one time i wasn't even conscious we clashed heads in the beginning, and I ended up winning this thing for two rounds of this shit. I'm like, let me see the videotape. I'm like, what I look like? You know, I had no idea. But the point is, but that's the thing is, you know, is do the mundane, the drills, the day in and day out. What people think about, they look at the physical side, but the mental side. Learn how to say that shit to yourself every day. So when something bad does happen, guess what? We bounce, we rebound, we pop back up to even, and we and we deal with it, and move on. And trust me, it's not easy winning world titles. Winning all this shit it had nothing to do Absolutely. with trying to figure that out. I'm constantly learning. Man, listen, like that's a mic dropping on its own, bro. See, it just naturally <laughs> comes to you, dude. It just naturally comes to you, and it's raw and real. So, okay. you've said this a couple times, man, and I want to reiterate this. Um, I completely believe that time is our greatest asset, and then you gave us like you know 50, 55 minutes, hour somewhere around there. So, I'm I'm so grateful for you. I'm grateful for the time that you spent with me when we were in Georgia, man, just hanging out and shooting the shit back and forth, and I got to know you. So I'm grateful for that. It's kind of led us to this point. Um, again, I will go ahead and put on um, your Twitch handle too. So that went on the post. So if anybody wants to um, to go look up Jen's stuff, it's so fun just to watch Jen's narrate. And the pause is pretty amazing. I've been able to experience it. So, <laughs> so brother, the pause, man, man, the from, pause. The, from the bottom of my heart, dude, I thank you so you much for, t for making time for us today and for making time for our listeners. Sure. I know they're going to take away some good shit and implement it. Um, Paul, do you want to say anything to, to Mr. Jens, Paul, before we head out of here? Jens, I just want you to know, man, and I'm sure you've been told, but you have such an amazing gift that you are giving the world and you're giving everybody you interact with. So keep doing that, brother. We're in your corner. You. And second, I'm going to leave this second conversation we've had doing the same thing I did after the first conversation we had, and that's to call my mother and tell her how much I love her. And, and just how grateful for, I am for how she raised me. So thank you for that gift and that reminder as well, brother. Yep. And now the father's out there too. Remember, man, stand up, man, big time. Because remember, my whole goal in life was to be a, a kick-ass dad. And like I said, just because for me, but that's something that, again, I talked about because I was raised by mom. And the same thing with militants. We want to start this thing, making mom smile. You know what I mean? But there's a lot to be said about those dads that go out there. You don't realize the kind of weight that you have. And that's what I'm saying is now that's been my goal is to be the best damn dad, I, you know, on the planet. And I just want my kids, I want them to be proud. I want them to be proud of their mother and their father. You know what I mean? And so it, it's big. And again, like I said, but yeah, call your mother. No call matter, your mother. Man, call I don't your mama. I don't think you're going to have to worry about your, uh, your, your family being proud of you, brother. I think you got that part wrapped up and you've been a pretty good example of that. So, um, but yeah, shout out to the dads too. I'm a dad, you know, of four. So, um, but thanks again, brother. I appreciate you so much. You know, we've kind of started a, a cool friendship here and something that I cherish and we'll keep going. And who yes, knows, sir. man, we may, if I could get Jen's in studio at one point throughout this year, 
I know. I love watching him. He's full. He's so animated. We'll do it. And we'll he's, do it. And he's, I'm working on getting on the road, man. I got <laughs> road stuff to do. Is I got to start traveling. That's the one thing. Again, this whole stream and what it's got me doing is I want to start going out and meeting people. And, and again, like I want to look – I'm such a fan of what people do. When I finally got to build my first ever PC, that's been a bucket list of mine for a long time. And yeah, you know, I mean, my man, you know, Cody and Sean came in here and they were telling me over the headset how to fix it. It took me about six and a half hours, but I'm such a wannabe <laughs> nerd. I'm such a wannabe. I want to be able to build this stuff. It, <laughs> it, it, it took me a long I went all this, my whole fighting career just to be able to go out there and build this PC. And it was a bucket list ordeal. So I love to go around and watch and see how people do it because now that I've finally gone to that level of we're all world champions or we need to get to that mindset. There's no difference between what I do, what you do, what everybody does, it's just how we do it, what we're willing to do, the, the risk. But more than anything is we can all do the exciting shit because that's the exciting shit, of course. You know what I mean? Of course I want to throw the touchdown pass, but – what about the day in and day out to get there Love and it. doing that mundane stuff? Just and that's what people need to understand. For days. Bulwark can go for days on this stuff. Yeah, so, I'm hey, done. I'm hey, done. And we out. are world champ nerds. That, oh, that's my, oh, see? It's my man. There it is. That's it. That's it. Now I'm, a, so I'm trying to get to that world. One day, I'm going to get to that <laughs> world. Like, I won't have to sit here and do this green screen because I'm going to know how to fix this shit. That's where I'm at. You got it, man. All you got to do is just chip away day after day to figure hey, out that green there, screen. I'm hit, hey. I'm hitting Google right out once it's over. And like I said, I was all confident. And I just jumped in with about 1030, knowing that this was at 11. I'm like, ah, I'm just going to turn everything on. We're going to smoke. And you know what I mean? We're going to just start smoking away and everything's going to just boom. It's going to go and we're going to be, everything's going to work. You know what I mean? Then all of a sudden I'm like, what the? Hey, it's kind of ironic <laughs> since we're talking about overcoming panic. adversity. <laughs> yep. And that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm telling you. And then I had panic, panic, thought about bailing out, going, heck no, I can't do that. So let's just go with the green screen and just own it. It's like, yeah, my man. I couldn't figure this out, so it is what it is. My man. Well, Learn hey, how to be your old friend first. Well, shout out to your boy Snoopy uh, for yeah, helping on the technical side of things. And then also shout out to my man Kyle, who does production on the podcast. So I appreciate you, brother. Um, so to go ahead and wrap this sucker up again, Jens, man, I, I dude, so grateful. Man, you got to check Thanks. out his Twitch. Like I said, we'll post it in our um, when we post all of our stuff for this episode. Um, be sure to join us for the next episode with um, James Orsini, who was Gary Vaynerchuk's COO at VaynerMedia for a long time, who now runs the Sasha Group. This guy's background is pretty incredible on in the business side of things. And if you've ever consumed Gary Vaynerchuk's content and the crazy ideas that he has, James is a guy that had to take that, wrangle it in, and then make it into something amazing. So um, stay tuned for that. Jens, again, appreciate you, brother. I cannot thank you enough. Your story is amazing. It's inspiring to me, man. And keep on keeping on and keep kicking some ass, brother. Thank you for listening to To The Point. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please consider leaving us a review in the App Store. And don't forget to share with your friends. Till next time, kick some ass.